November 26, 1978, fire broke out at the Holiday Inn on Ridge Road in Greece. Hundreds of people were inside. By the time this fast-moving fire was put out, 10 people were dead and the building was destroyed. Welcome to What Were They Thinking, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Philip Tommaso. Hi, this is Phil Tommaso. It is Monday, March 6th, and we are that much closer to spring, right around the corner, March 21st, March 20th, depending on who you ask. Today, we're going to be doing our, our third episode. It's a, another cold case that I'm calling the best surprise is no surprise. If you are not familiar with who I am, other than through the podcast, I do work full time as a fire and EMS dispatcher for the emergency communications department. That's Monroe County's 911 center, where we handle uh, pretty much the entire county of Monroe for dispatching fire, EMS, and police to emergencies. I even wrote a book about it entitled Nothing Good Happens After Midnight, Confessions of a 911 Dispatcher. Uh, it talks about uh, how we try to find balance between work, crazy work schedules, hard work schedules, family, friends, and uh, trying to maintain some semblance of happiness. <laughs> it's a pretty good book. It's a fun book. A lot of good stories in there. A lot of heartbreaking stories as well. But you get a feel for what dispatchers go through. We like to consider ourselves the first first responders since we are the initial contact for those in crisis or in an emergency situation. And we remain many times on the phone with those callers until they are able to uh, get the first re- the actual first responders on scene to them. That's why this case is a very interesting one. I was talking about it just recently with a, a coworker because it's unsolved for decades as well and uh, troubling. It's one of those troubling ones that you have this pit in your stomach because you're pretty sure everyone knows who was behind the incident, but nothing can or has been done to bring any closure to the case or to the families and friends personally impacted uh, on that particular night. I call this episode two cold case, the best surprise is no surprise. And if you're not familiar with that slogan, the best surprise is no surprise. It was once part of a holiday in highly effective campaign, and it went on for decades. Unpleasant surprises were the norm in the 1950s when it came to traveling by a car uh, on the interstate highway system, right? So they figured by saying the best surprise is no surprise, you felt secure, safe at a Holiday Inn. You got what you expected. You went to bed. You woke up. Everything was co-aesthetic. You know what I'm saying? So almost 45 years ago, a Holiday Inn and a hotel in Greece, New York, which is where I live and where I have lived uh, for the better part of my life. I'm actually two minutes. Uh, I could walk to where this hotel once stood. Um, They faced an unwanted surprise, a deadly surprise. A raging fire engulfed the building, and not everyone made it out alive. What you may not know, is that no one was ever arrested. No one was ever charged with this fire, even though, as you will see, arson was clearly at the forefront. The Holiday Inn Hotel was on fire, and the hotel was nearly full that night with 200 guests. So Sunday, November 26th, 1978, so we're going all the way back to the 1900s on this one, 1978, it was around 2 a.m., and what has been reported as a balmy 
20 degrees with a 10 mile per hour wind out of the north. Just so you get a feel for the night. Harold Bud Phillips, an off duty lieutenant for the Grease Ridge Fire Department, claims he saw flames and black smoke as he traveled in his car along West Ridge Road. At the time, Grease, New York was not a part of the 911 call center. This is back when people affixed stickers with emergency contact numbers on the house phone. If you remember house phones, at the base of them, there would always be this little sticker with fire and then a phone number, police, a phone number, ambulance, a phone number. Everybody had these stickers on their phones before there was the central 911 that you could call. So like I was saying, the, the Holiday Inn was on fire and there was 200 guests in this hotel on this particular night in November. Many of these guests were visitors from Canada who had come across the border on a tour bus for a USA shopping excursion. It's a very common thing. These tour buses bring Canadians across the border and vice versa. Americans head up to places like Toronto where they can spend the day shopping. And it's a, a, a bus trip. So Phillips said when he was driving down the road, he saw the fire and had pulled into the back of the structure so he could use his uh, fire department radio to notify his department of the blaze. The fire department arrived on scene and every effort was made to save those inside the hotel. The sound of windows breaking and people screaming competed with the sirens from the first responders, the fire trucks, the police cars, there was ambulances, all responding to this blaze. As firefighters entered the building, guests poured out of, uh, from the exits all around. They're dressed you know, pretty much in the clothing they went to bed in. It's November, it's, it's cold out. And you've got people in pajamas and in and, and night dresses. Buses did arrive and the survivors who made it out of the hotel were ushered on board uh, so that they could get out of the cold and some, get some rehabilitation while, while the fire department fought the fire. One firefighter, not 10 feet inside the hotel, stumbled upon a young woman and then saw beside her another lady and yet a third not far away. So getting the people out became the main priority. Fighting the fire was also essential, but trying to get everyone out is what everyone was scrambling to, to do to, to get done. The parking lot of the hotel had become something of a, a makeshift morgue. In, in some corners, persons performed CPR. In other areas, cloths were being draped over victims who didn't survive. And the postage stamp part of Greece now better resembled a war zone than an otherwise quiet part of town. Nothing could be done until the inferno was extinguished. And once those flames were out, the fire, investiga uh, fire investigators moved in, looking for answers to, to what happened. So the tragedy is 10 people died. Seven of those people were from Canada, and another 34 people were injured. Turns out the fire's point of origin was in the basement area of the hotel. And investigators looked for the cause, but they knew one thing for certain. This was not an accidental fire. They strongly suspected arson. The investigation revealed a flammable liquid had been poured in the stairwell and inside a closet and around that closet. Fire temperatures on the first floor Use fires, fire temperatures on a first floor fire usually reach around 400 degrees. Because of a melted kick plate on one of the doors, they knew the temperatures had possibly exceeded 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a pretty extreme difference between 400 and 1200 degrees. Greece police chief Gerald Fallon knew one thing for certain, the hotel was now a crime scene. After clearing away debris on the first floor, samples were sent uh, to a lab for testing. 
Returned results revealed the flammable liquid used as an accelerant was something called MEK, M-E-K, methyl ethyl ketone. MEK is a colorless flammable liquid with a sharp odor. It can be harmful to the eyes, skin, and if held, swallowed, could be detrimental. It's used as a solvent and in the manufacturing of synthetic rubber, special waxes, and to make other chemical products. Most commonly, it's used as or found in cleaning agents. Joel Crane, the assistant district attorney at the time, had stated a normal person, I like how he says this, this is an actual quote, a normal person would use gasoline or kerosene or benzene or something else that was more readily accessible at a hardware store or a gas station. Someone using MEC had to know a thing or two about starting fires. The town brought in John Evans. He was a fire marshal uh, from New York City. He was considered something of a, an investigative guru, a fire investigative guru, uh, kind of a hot shot out of New York City, John Evans. And so they brought him in to assist in the investigation on this fire. Uh, aside from agreeing the fire was arson, Evans and Chief Fallon thought one person in particular stood out as a primary suspect. Evans said, Harold Phillips, the lieutenant firefighter who called in the hotel fire, had become a person of interest. During interviews with media and others, Phillips said he had been driving down the road, saw the fire, drove into the back of the hotel parking lot where he used his department radio to call in the fire. Evans believed it would have been impossible to see the fire driving down or along West Ridge Road. Lieutenant Phillips was interviewed by police and given a polygraph, which Phillips failed. However, polygraphs then and I believe now are still not considered 100% reliable and couldn't be used as, a, as proof during a criminal uh, trial regardless. But it, it's still interesting that he failed it. But there was not enough uh, to show reasonable cause to believe Phillips had committed this felony. The prosecutors at the time wanted enough proof beyond a reasonable doubt if they were going to take anyone to trial over the fire and over the deaths. To make the idea of a trial more complicated, there were also no witnesses. So circumstantial evidence would not be enough to secure a conviction. And if you know anything about legal prosecutors, they like wins. They like convictions. It's good for their numbers. It's good for everything. So going into something where they're almost confident they're not going to win didn't or doesn't or at the time didn't make enough sense for them. So unfortunately, no one was ever charged with starting the fire, and no one was ever charged with the murder of the 10 patrons of the hotel who burned to death or died of smoke inhalation. 10 people did not make it out of that hotel alive. Funny thing, and I say funny is more ironic, in 20. 2012, nearly 35 years after this fire, a Canadian investigative news and media company known as 16 by 9 relaunched their own investigation and sent a reporter, uh, reporter and camera crew to Greece, New York. They came down to Rochester. The media crew interviewed Ted Baxter. Baxter uh, spent 23 years with the Rochester Police Department, and then he became the chief of Greece police in 2010. So he's two years on the job here. After that, he moved on uh, as well in 2018 to become the Monroe County Sheriff. Pretty much uh, uh, a love sheriff uh, everywhere. People people really like Ted Baxter, uh, Todd Baxter. So... Six, 16 by 9, anyway, to get back to the point, 16 by 9 lit a fire, if you want to 
excuse the pun, they lit a fire under authorities. Baxter enlisted the help of the FBI and together evidence from the 1978 Holiday Inn fire were once again being reviewed. The families of those who perished in the fire were still without answers. They were still without closure. And it seemed as if finally, maybe potentially, they would get the resolution they've waited well over three decades to receive. In an interview with 16 by 9, Baxter did identify Harold Phillips as still a person of interest. He said this on camera, and I watched the video over and over. He uh, was not shy about pointing Harold Phillips, Harold Bud Phillips, as a person of interest. And he said it, if you watch the video clip, I've got it in my research links. He, uh, he kind of gets this crooked smile, like, you know, we don't have enough. What are we going to, it was a very knowing smile. Um, at least the way I interpreted his reaction when being interviewed. However, some of, uh, some things had changed over the 35 year gap, just so I could bring you up to speed. Harold Bud Phillips was no longer a lieutenant with the Grease Ridge Fire Department. And the name of the fire department had changed too. In the year 2000, Phillips had become the fire chief. So now he's the chief. And at some point thereafter, the Grease Ridge Fire Department uh, name changed to the Ridge Road Fire Department. And Phillips was the man in charge. Without the chief, because that's what he was, without the chief's knowledge, officers issued a search warrant and removed items from the firehouse. This didn't sit well with Chief Phillips. And it turns out one week before the Holiday Inn fire, Phillips had been charged with a building inspection of the hotel. And when I say charged, I mean assigned. As the lieutenant, it was his task to perform a building inspection of the hotel. And he did submit a report citing minor infractions. However, there was also an amended report subsequently filed identical to the initial report, but with added documentation that recommended the hotel hook up its fire alarm to the fire department. The hotel did not have a sprinkler system you got to remember, one wasn't required by law at the time. Some of the fire alarms worked during the fire. Reports indicate after the fire that many did not activate. And the alarms that worked were not tied to any monitoring system. So if activated, they just alarmed the guests staying in the hotel without directly ringing in or alarming with the fire department or at a 911 center. You know, when you see those red pull stations in a school or in a, in a building and you pull it down and the alarms go off, those are generally tied to a box system alerting dispatchers or fire departments that there's something wrong at the location. Nothing like that existed at this particular Holiday Inn. So Harold Phillips has maintained his innocence, claiming no involvement in the starting of the Holiday Inn fire throughout the years, although he has avoided any subsequent interviews. Back when the fire took place, he was more than happy to give his interviews as a young lieutenant with his 15 minutes of fame, talking to anyone and everyone who had a microphone or camera. Uh, he insists that the fire at the Holiday Inn was accidental and not arson, and is that's contrary to the proof and evidence well established by police and the New York City Fire Marshal and the FBI. Everyone else is saying it was arson, and Chief Phillips is saying, no, it was accidental. At one point, 16 by 9 does track down uh, Chief Phillips, and it looks like by the by the building in the parking lot 
it was a Tim Hortons, which is, again, a little ironic, Tim Hortons being a Canadian franchise. And he uh, he allowed them to throw a couple quick questions at him, but he refused any answer other than he was not involved and it was not arson. And he was upset that the search warrant had been executed of the fire department without his knowledge in the early 2000s. So here we are now, 45 years later, with no viable suspects, no answers, no closure for the friends and families of the 10 victims who died in the blaze at the Holiday Inn back on that cool November in 1978. We've got nothing. And although the 16 by 9 investigation was fascinating three-part series to watch, uh, it's, again, it's in my research. There's links. We, we can't go further. And Phillips has since retired from the Ridge Road Fire Department for quite a while while I was dispatching. He was still the man in charge even then. Even then, and I started in 2009. I can't remember the exact date that he retired from Ridge Road. It was not all that long ago. 2015, maybe. 2016. Right around there. So here we are in 2023. 2023, and with all our technology and research, it's unfortunate that we're unable to bring closure or provide solid answers to what happened. I believe that a lot of people know what happened. It is important that I point out at this point, at the end of this episode, that while working as a dispatcher, I did have interactions occasionally with Chief Phillips, both on the telephone and on the opposite side of the radio. I want to stress that I had no actual friendship or relationship with Bud Phillips, other than occasionally interacting with him while I was at work. I have no additional or informative information. The data I collected while doing research came from countless news sites and videos from places like YouTube where I put together what I consider my cohesiveness or my cohesive uh, rendition of the events as they unfolded based on the research I'd conducted, not through any personal interviews conducted with uh, Bud Phillips or anyone from the fire department, the Ridge Road Fire Department. I just wanted to make that clear. I am not a fire investigator. I am not a police officer. I did not conduct any investigations. I have no other knowledge other than what I've read and put together for this episode. None. I'm not in any way accusing nor clearing uh, Bud Phillips of the events that happened in 1978. I am just merely what I guess I would say is reporting based on what was learned. I just wanted to point that out. I think it's important because people may miss read my position as a fire dispatcher and the fact that I did know or knew of or occasionally dealt with one of the prime suspects in this horrendous uh, situation. So that's that's that. I just wanted to put that out there. I hope you understand. Anyway, that wraps up our latest edition, our latest episode. It's quite the fascinating fire. You can do a lot of research of uh, for it on your own as well. Until next week, though, we will uh, we'll leave you here. Hopefully it's a beautiful day where you are and you can enjoy the weather. I know that's what I'm about to do. Thank you for listening to this latest episode of What Were They Thinking? A True Crime Podcast. 
be sure to subscribe, follow, like, share. And as always, we'll see you next time. Have a great day.